All right, we will go ahead and begin. Um, first, uh, just promos for the other um, upcoming courses this summer from the Biblical School. Uh, the Holy Eucharist, the Body, Blood, Soul, and Divinity of Jesus, a three-week online short course with Derek Barr. Um, that's running mornings and evenings beginning on June 7th. So June 7th, June 14th, June 21st, uh, with a $50 registration fee. Then, um, Grandparents Got Secret Weapon to Pass on the Faith. That's a free Saturday online workshop. Um, all of these are online. Um, with Sandy Wanzak, um, 9.30 a.m. till noon 30 on July 22nd. Again, that's a free workshop. And then a six-week online short course with our director, Daniel Campbell, on the Liturgy of the Hours, the Canticle of Divine Praise. Um, that begins the week of July 23rd, and that will be Tuesdays and Thursdays in the mornings and the evenings. And the Liturgy Hours is something that we'll be talking about today um, once we get into the liturgy that was written for um, Corpus Christi, involved writing hymns and readings for the Liturgy of the Hours. Um, I am recording this um, lecture tonight. So for all of you, I'll be sending out, um, I'll be uploading it to YouTube just because that's by far the easiest way to share recordings um, with video. I'm also, I also have a separate audio recording that I'm making. So if you just wanna be able to hear the lecture um, without seeing the notes, um, I can make that available as well. Um, since this is a large group, um, we had over 300 people sign up for this. Um, I've muted all of you and I've turned off your ability to unmute yourselves just because with 300 people, the odds that someone's going to accidentally unmute themselves uh, becomes almost certain. Um, so the way that I'm gonna structure this is I've divided up the lecture into four parts. After each part, which I'm hoping to keep between 20 and 25 minutes, um, we'll take a quick break for questions, um, three to five minutes. Um, also a bit of a mental break just because there's so much to talk about in Corpus Christi that it's a two hour lecture. Um, I probably have four hours worth of material here. I'm gonna try not to speak hyper fast so that you miss everything, um, but I'm gonna do the best that I can. And if I go too long for one section, um, I'll do what I can to, um, make up for that in other sections. Uh, but that's the general structure. So um, we'll have about a mental break in about 20 to 25 minutes um, before we sort of rehash it and go into the next section. Um, and I'll be emailing links for the recordings later on um, if you'd like to listen to it again. Um, oh, final thing. Um, as I was talking about um, Director Campbell's course on the Liturgy of the Hours, if you plan on taking a year-long course through the biblical school next year, um, that's a full year of the biblical school, the catechetical school, or any year-long enrichment course, uh, just go ahead and sign up for the Liturgy of the Hours course. It's a $100 registration fee, but if you're signing up for a year-long course, um, you get a $100 voucher. So if you're going to do a course through the biblical school, it's basically free. Um, Okay, so now I've done all of the self and group promotion, which is my least favorite thing on earth to do. Um, so now we'll go with prayer. Um, and this is the opening prayer, the collect for Corpus Christi that you'll be hearing in church um, next Sunday. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen. Oh God, who in this wonderful sacrament has left us a memorial of thy passion, Grant us, we beseech, to venerate the sacred mysteries of thy body and blood in such a way that we may ever sense within us the fruit of thy redemption, who lives and reigns. Amen. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Um, so what we have in this lecture, the history, the story of Corpus Christi, um, it's so much more than just the story of a feast. This is, as I was putting together the notes for this, um, which I absolutely loved because I, I got to go back to some materials that I haven't looked at 
um, since my first year in graduate school. So books I haven't picked up off the shelf for 20 years. Um, I got to feel like I did a good job not selling those books for secondhand price because I got to use them at least one more time. Um, but in going through all the materials, you know, the conclusion that I came to in Corpus Christi, what we're really looking at with the point of tonight's lecture is, is you get to see the formation of the sacramental worldview, the basic view that we have as Catholics of life, the universe, and everything, God and his relationship to creation. Um, is a sacramental worldview in which all of creation is intended, all of creation plays some role in providence, God's plan for um, us and the entire universe. And the way, the proper way of understanding the universe is coming to understand the role that every bit of creation has to play in what we call salvation history. Um, it's not a natural worldview. It's a worldview that um, wasn't just gifted to the church by the Holy Spirit. It's something that revealed itself over time. Um, the church fathers talk about sacraments all the time. Don't get me wrong. The patristic age, um, Augustine, the idea of what a sacrament is is something that they pondered. But the full development of this sacramental worldview is something um, that the fall of the Roman Empire makes sure kind of doesn't happen. There's a 500 year hiatus and it's with the medieval meditation on the Eucharist and what it means that this sacramental worldview comes into um, its complete setting. And what we end up with in the 13th and the 14th century, we end up with this, fe this feast day, um, the body of Christ, and we end up with a sense of the Eucharist that is more profound than had really been popularly, and by popularly, I mean by the entire group of people, not just by theologians, but by the entire Christian people, um, the materiality of Christ, the bodiliness of Jesus Christ as man. Um, is given a more positive light in the 13th and 14th century than it had ever had before. And frankly, I think that it's had since then. Um, because the understanding the positivity of the bodiliness of Jesus Christ requires this sacramental worldview. And until this worldview is established, and it can only be established by being opposed by different worldviews, um, it's impossible to fully appreciate the positivity um, of that body. And it's this time that we come up with that clear definition of what the human being actually is, the psychosomatic unity, the unity of body and soul. Um, as Thomas Aquinas says, I am not my soul, my soul is not me. There's an idea that your mind is your real you and your body is just a carrier or a vehicle. It was, it's a popular idea, it's a profoundly anti-Catholic idea. Um, and it's the philosophical tools that the 13th century has to describe these theological truths that allow all of this to be expressed so clearly for the first time. Um, so what we have is an incredible story that begins with a five-year-old orphan girl and results in Eucharistic processions and Eucharistic adoration happening for the first time. It results in holy women running from church to church to see how many times could they see the elevation of the host to literally see God. Um, it's this incredible de devotion to the Eucharist and the recognition of God's presence with us that we simply don't have before. Um, so with that, I'll get started and I will try to keep this to the time limits that I've set. Um, so we begin with the founder of the feast. Um, Corpus Christi is associated so much with Thomas Aquinas because he wrote the liturgy for it and because he provided um, the clear definitions of what it is that we actually believe in the Eucharist. But Corpus Christi um, predates Thomas Aquinas. Um, and we have to go outside of Italy to Liège in what's now Belgium. Um, and a saint, Juliana of Liege, who's probably not nearly as well known as she should be, 
um, who receives a vision. And from this vision, we end up having the first feast day that is papally mandated for the entire church. Um, so Liège, as I said, the best map that I could find is in French. So if you studied French in high school and remember a little bit of it, this will be helpful. Otherwise, the names are pretty much all the same. Uh, Liège is, as I said, in modern day Belgium. What's important is during our time. It's outside of the Kingdom of France. It's outside of French culture. It's technically part of the Holy Roman Empire, but it's in this borderland. Um, it's a cultural borderland between what would become Germany and what would become France. Um, and it's an incredibly religiously fruitful borderland. Um, in the 12th and 13th century, there's an incredible rise in a very particular kind of devotion that's especially focused among women in this area, um, what's known as um, Lotharingia. It's a horrible name. Um, but the cross-cultural bit that you have in this area goes all the way back to Charlemagne's grandsons. Um, and the beginning of the debate about the Eucharist and what it really was also goes back to Charlemagne's grandsons. Um, but we'll come to that in a moment. So Liège is part of this borderland where you're not, you're in the Holy Roman Empire, but you're not a, Ger a German culture. You're outside of the French, the emerging French monarchy. So there's French culture there, um, but there isn't the presence of the French monarchy. And in this area, particularly in the 12th and 13th century, women's devotion becomes incredibly important. Um, not just the traditional um, nuns that, you see throughout Europe, but a group of women that come to be known as Beguines, who were quite often lay women who had families. Um, sometimes they were um, widowed. Women tended to marry much older men in the Middle Ages, so widowdom was something that was very common. Um, but it was women who felt called to have a communal life modeled on the religious life that you had in convents, um, modeled on ideas of service, of a shared prayer life. And in this area where these women are very, are very common, um, certain orders sort of take on the leadership of providing some sort of institutional control over this, uh, because a group of gung-ho lay religious people is a good thing, but without any institutional control, um, groups of very devout people quite often splinter off into heresies. Um, and that happens throughout the Middle Ages. Um, and eventually these groups of women, these begins will be very suspect by other um, people within the church. But in the 12th and 13th century, they're generally approved of and appreciated. Um, and then within the age, it's originally the Cistercians, the monastic reform movement of the 11th and 12th century that sort of takes on a leading role of looking over these women and providing them um, sort of official institutional sponsorship and supervision. And then after 1229, the Dominicans come to Liège and they pick up this role as well. Um, and the Dominicans are incredibly important in this story of um, the development of Corpus Christi. So Juliana of Liège, as I said, um, is probably born about 1190 to 1193, and she's orphaned at five years old. Um, and when she's orphaned, she is brought to a leper house that was attached to a Primant's Detention Foundation at Mont Cornelion. Um, the Primont's Detentions were a group of what are called Augustinian canons, that is, they were priests. Um, they weren't monks, um, but they were priests that had desired, as clerics, that they wanted to live um, under a rule. That is, they wanted to live under, they wanted to live under a monastic rule rather than what's sometimes called the secular clergy. Um, and they had established a priory at Mount Cornelion, and along with their priory, they had a leper house. And along with the lepers that were served in a leper house, you also had various other groups of people that were brought in. Um, and this included um, women that were trying to find a religious life. 
Um, and so Juliana of Liège at the age of five is brought into this leper house where she um, grows up in this religious community. Um, in somewhere between 1208 and 1210, she has a dream vision. And in this dream vision, she sees a full moon. Um, and whenever you see Juliana of Liège, there's always this full moon that's in the background. Um, and the full moon is beautiful and brilliant. Um, and the full moon it has been, is associated in the medieval glosses on the Bible with the church itself. It's beautiful and it's brilliant, but it has this spot that's out of it. And she takes this dream and she keeps it to herself for the next 20 years. Until in 1230, she becomes uh, the prioress of the women's part of the priory at Mount Corneon. And in 1230, after becoming prioress, she reveals this vision to her confessor, um, a priest, John of La Son, um, and her friend, Eve of Liege. Both of them are, they're not associated with Mount Corneillon. They are with the oldest church that is within the city of Liege. Um, and John of La Son becomes her confessor. Eve of Liège was an anchoress. Um, that is, she was she lived a private, secluded, religious life within the church um, under the guidance of John of Lazon. Um, she ends up becoming a lifelong friend. She outlives Juliana. And when the feast is actually proclaimed, she personally receives a letter from a pope announcing that the feast has been approved. Juliana reveals this first vision, and then she also reveals that she had a second dream in that same year. Um, and 20 years later, she has a dream. And in this dream, Christ appears to her and Christ explains the meaning of the dream, that the church is almost perfect, except for this little fracture in it. Um, and that fracture is it is one feast day that they're missing that needs to be approved. And the feast day that needs to be approved is that of Corpus Christi. So she reveals to her confessor that she has a dream in which Christ comes to her and interprets a dream that she's been thinking about for 20 years. Um, Father John of La Son has connections all over Liège. And Liège was a fairly important city. Um, at the, in Juliana's time, it was a cathedral city. It had 26 parishes. It had seven collegiate churches, um, churches with these canons regular, these um, priests, these clerics who lived under a sort of a monastic kind of rule. Um, it had two Benedictine abbeys, and it had a ton of schools. And in these schools, there were 300 clerics um, that were studying studying at some level. Um, it wasn't a university itself, but they had um, preparatory schools that could lead to the universities. Um, and John of Lausanne seems to know all of the major figures, and so he takes... Juliana of Liege's dream, and he reports it to the head of the Dominican order within the city, and also to the theologians of Liege. Um, and her dream meets with their approval. Um, there is a separate John, a brother John, who is within the priory of Mont Corneillon, and Juliana enlists him to write the liturgy of this, although it's it's widely assumed by scholars now that basically Juliana more or less had the original liturgy in mind and that this brother John basically just served as a scribe and wrote it out. Um, the cathedral canons, that is the clerics who were part of the cathedral chapter, they opposed this. And one of the major stories, and you see this in the life of basically every, every female mystic or saint in the Middle Ages who is not secluded in a convent, but who's actually engaged in the world around her. Um, they are all opposed at some point in time by powerful people. And at this point in time, the cathedral chapter, and it it's not said clearly, but it seems the bishop himself opposes this idea. Um, in 1232, the prior of Mount Corneillon dies. He had supported Julian. The new prior that comes in opposes Juliana's views. He deposes her as prioress, and she basically has to flee. 
And so you see the second part of what goes on is that she is entrusted with this vision to change the church, um, but her vision is also going to be attacked and she, she suffers for it. Um, she's driven from her home. In 1240, the old bishop dies, or the old bishop had died in 1238. The new one isn't appointed until 1240, Robert of Turot. He fully supports her after he comes in with new ideas, after he's met some of her supporters, um, she comes to him and he's very much in support of the idea of Corpus Christi. Um, he ends up deposing the prior of Mount Corneon who had opposed her. Um, Juliana goes back to being prioress and he, of the people that come into Liège with Bishop Robert, one of them is Jacques Pantaleone, um, who's going to be incredibly important in the story. He's named the Archdeacon of Campines, but he's basically the Archdeacon, one of the most important priests in the city of Liège. Um, by 1246, Bishop Robert has decided, has, has taken the decision on the idea of Corpus Christi after he personally consults with the Dominican leaders in Liège, and he also sends the question off to the bishop, or I'm sorry, to the theologians at the University of Paris. Um, and none of them are opposed to the idea of this particular feast. So in 1246, um, he declares the feast to be celebrated in Liège. It is, um, the, but then he ends up dying in October. And the new bishop that comes in after that, as so often happens, undoes the work of his predecessor. And part of what he undoes is the support for Juliana. Um, Juliana is outcast again, and she'll spend the rest of her life in exile. Um, she, forgive the phrase, but she, she sort of bounces around um, Northern France in this area of Lotharingia. Um, she's hosted by the Cistercians. The Cistercians were always large supporters. Of her. Um, and she ends up spending the last two years of her life at the Cistercian Abbey at Fosse, where she dies in 1259. Um, so she dies sort of seemingly in catastrophe, that she's been given this vision, her vision was approved, it was supported, it was put into place, and then she lost all support. She's cast out of her home. It looks like her feast is going to go nowhere. Um, and she bounces around as an exile from place to place until she spends the last two years of her life at this abbey, but she dies without any sense that her life's mission will be fulfilled. Um, she dies what ordinarily would have been a tragic death, but this of course is not going to be a tragic story. Um, after Juliana dies, her cause had already been picked up by a particularly important man, Cardinal Hugh of Saint-Cher, um, who's part of the Dominican order. He had visited Liège in 1251. Um, so Juliana wasn't there. She was in exile, but he makes a visit to St. Martin, that, the most ancient church of um, Liège that had both um, Jean Lazone, her confessor, and Eve of Liège, her close friend, that anchoress. Um, so Cardinal Hugh in 1251 hears from them about um, Corpus Christi, and it seems that in, their, in this church of St. Martin, they had been celebrating Corpus Christi continuously since 1246. Um, and he's able to basically give the support of the Dominican order to continuing the celebration of this feast. He's made a papal legate in Germany. Um, in this time period, there's huge problems in the Holy Roman Empire because of a major conflict between the previous Holy Roman Emperor, Frederick II, and the popes. It was basically a 20 year literal war between the two. Um, and so after Frederick dies in 1250, um, the popes have a lot of cleaning up to do in the Holy Roman Empire. And so they appoint um, a papal legate to go into Germany and act with full papal authority. Um, and the person that they pick is um, Cardinal Hugh. So Cardinal Hugh um, basically insists that the feast of Corpus Christi be celebrated throughout all of the areas that he has um, his legatine power over, which is everything from Lorraine, what's now Eastern France, all the way off to Pomerania, Northeastern Germany, and Bohemia. 
Um, his successor in this role, Peter Capocci, um, ends up confirming the feast throughout the exact same lands. This wouldn't have been enough to keep it going, however. What becomes very important was that archdeacon Jacques Pantaleone, um, who it's, it doesn't seem that he ever met Juliana directly, but he was very sympathetic to her. Um, most high churchmen in the Middle Ages came from noble families. Um, the nobility kind of monopolized high church offices the way that they monopolized secular ones. Um, Jacques Pantaleone was one of those who came from a very humble background and through education and ambition worked his way up. Um, and it seems that for this reason, sort of being an outsider in a world surrounded by nobility, um, he had a natural support for the holy women that were trying to live holy lives within the cities and facing opposition. While he was in Liège, he ended up writing a book um, a, a, that would give um, rules to the religious life followed by these women that begins. The La Bellis de Regula Vita Beginarum, the, the little book on the rule and life of the Beguines. Um, he was in Liège until 1248. He was made a bishop in 1249. And then in 1255, he was made patriarch of Jerusalem. Um, in 1260, oh, that's a typo there. In 1261, um, he was elected Pope, where he took the name Urban IV. Um, and as Pope, um, he, his papacy only lasted three years, um, a little over that. Um, but one of the last things that he did was in his bull Transitoris de Hoc Mundo, um, he approved the, force, the feast of Corpus Christi for the entire church. Um, he wrote letters to all of the prelates, to all of the bishops, archbishops, cardinals, legates, all throughout the church. Um, and sometime between August 11th and other dates are given, I think September 6th for when this was published, um, making Corpus Christi a feast throughout the universal church. Um, most of the copies of this bull weren't actually sent, however, um, and he ended up dying shortly thereafter. So we, there's the letter that he sent to all of the prelates about this. He personally wrote to his successor as the patriarch, uh, the patriarch of Jerusalem, um, and he also wrote to Juliana's friend, Eve of Liege. And the letter that he sent to Eve of Liege also included a new liturgy. And the new liturgy is the one that he commissioned to be written by uh, St. Thomas Aquinas. While he was Pope, he spent most a fair amount of his time in Orvieto, um, almost the entire period, I believe, but definitely 1263 and 1264. Um, and while he was in Orvieto, he had Thomas Aquinas there with him um, in an official role with his curia. And this is when, as he's getting ready to make this a universal feast, this is when he encourages um, Aquinas to write the liturgy, to write the hymns for this. Um, and the hymns that we have that are still used today, um, that we'll be looking at in the last part of this lecture. Um, that's what Aquinas writes, which as far as Latin medieval poetry goes, the hymns that Aquinas wrote are just the masterpieces of medieval literature, um, not just medieval theology. However, after celebrating this feast twice in 1264, um, once on the Thursday following um, Trinity Sunday, and then once again in September. Urban IV dies, and with him, all of the papal interest in Corpus Christi seems to die. Um, there's no evidence that it was celebrated in the papal curia after his death until the 14th century. Um, but the letters had gone out, not all the letters that he wanted to send, but you also had the support of Juliana's supporters um, with, from Liège and from the areas close to Liège, including the city of Cologne, which was incredibly important um, both as a merchant city because it had ties to Venice, um, but it's also the home of Albert the Great, Albertus Magnus. Um, and that's where Thomas Aquinas himself is also in the 1240s. 
So in the 1270s, certain individual churches in Cologne are celebrating this, and from there it spreads to individual churches in Venice. In 1277, the entire Cistercian order adopted the feast. In 1287, the new Bishop of Liege, John of Cambrai, decides to accept the feast for the entire di diocese. In 1304, the Dominican order adopts it, but the most important moment for the history of this feast is in 1317. Um, Pope John the 22nd, who this is only his second year of the papacy, um, he basically reauthorizes the feast. What he did is um, he issued what are called a set of decretals. Um, one of the major forms of medieval study at this point in time was canon law. Um, almost all of the popes of the 13th and early 14th century were canon lawyers. And canon law doesn't have a single law book it's cobbled together from all of the different sources, what church councils say, um, individual papal rulings on cases. And so after each pope dies, all of the letters that that pope had written that sort of become official pronouncements and therefore part of canon law, those are put together in a collection that are called decretals. And John the 22nd did this for his predecessor, Clement. So this group that are known as the Clementine decretals includes the bull transitoris, which had never been fully um, sent out before. But since it's now a copy, since it's copied in these Clementine decretals, every diocese had to have at least one copy of these decretals just for the sake of having coherent canon law. This basically relaunches Corpus Christi and it's from here that it becomes um, the runaway success that it ends up being. Um, we should note that in 1323, uh, John XXII is also the Pope who canonized Aquinas. Um, there was some odd debate in the last century about whether Aquinas actually wrote this liturgy. Um, it came from the fact that none of the manuscripts of the liturgy um, attributing it to Thomas Aquinas appeared before the 1320s. I mean, the explanation for that is pretty simple, that um, the feast itself was almost completely forgotten after 1264 outside of these few pockets. Um, the survival of medieval manuscripts is incredibly rare. So the fact that nothing saying Aquinas wrote this appeared in the 13th century basically should be expected given the historical circumstances. Um, among scholars, uh, Almost everybody accepts these as being Aquinas' work, the liturgy. Um, if anyone's still in doubt, there's the fact that Bartholomew of Lucca, who lived to be 100 years old, um, was a student of Thomas Aquinas. Aquinas deeply respected him, and he ended up being Thomas Aquinas' confessor. He was at Avignon in 1317 when this papal bull was reissued, um, and he lists, I mean, he gives us his personal testimony that Thomas Aquinas wrote this. So unless we're going to believe that Thomas Aquinas' confessor is lying after his death, um, Aquinas' authorship of this is as close to certain as you can get. Um, so with that, um, I'll pause myself here rather than yammering on about this issue for another 20 minutes. Um, we'll take that break. If you have any questions, um, the easiest way to deal with those would be for you to type them into chat. Um, I'll also allow you to unmute yourself if you want to just you know, turn on your microphone and ask. Yeah. So in the chat room, there's, um, I'm sorry, in the chat, uh, the observation that poor Juliana got the Athanasius yeah, treatment. Um, yeah, um, and that's when she was canonized later on, and when they were actually debating um, 
the sincerity of her vision. The fact that she had to suffer for it was something that was definitely seen in her favor. Um, oh, so a question that I, <laughs> of the many things that I wanted to bring up, but just doesn't have time for. The Eucharistic miracle at Bolsena. So Bolsena is a town in Umbria. So that's just to the north of Rome. In 1263, there was a German priest. He's coming to Rome and as the tradition holds it, he has some doubts about the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist. And as he's saying mass in Bolsena, um, as, as he's consecrating the host, it begins to bleed. Um, and it bleeds on uh, the linen that's underneath it. And he takes this to the Pope at Orvieto, which Orvieto is not too far away from Bolsena. Um, The, the question of what was the relationship of this Eucharistic miracle to the founding of Corpus Christi? It was held sometimes that the Eucharistic miracle at Bolsena was what really prompted Urban IV. There's not any actual evidence for that. If you look at what Urban wrote in Transitoris, um, he's specifically referring to the story that he got out of Liege. So what happened to Bolsena certainly had to have been in his mind, uh, but Corpus Christi doesn't happen because of Bolsena. It's more likely that what happens at Bolsena confirms in Urban IV's mind how important it is to establish this feast that he sort of already wanted to establish and felt needed to be established. Um, oh, the, the question of the archdeacon and bishop. So um, our, when Jacques Pantaleone was archdeacon, he was archdeacon in Liège from 12, 1241 to 1248. Um, after that, he was promoted to bishop of a different diocese. He was not the bishop in um, Liège what, who that supported Juliana. That would have been Bishop Robert. Um, so he's the archdeacon, which at that point in time is one of the most important um, figures in the diocese um, in that part of Europe. Um, but he's not the Bishop of Liege, just for that clarification. And then the question of what more clearly represent the vision that Juliana saw. So what Juliana reports, what appears in her veto, is actually a pretty simple vision, um, a vision that's not clear at all. She sees the full moon. The full moon is beautiful and it's shimmering, um, but there's a fracture in it. Um, it's There's a part of it that's not shining brilliantly. And there's no explanation of this dream for the next 20 years of her life. So she has this dream when she's only like 18, somewhere between 16 and 18 years old. Um, and then 20 years later, she has a second dream. And in that dream, Christ comes to her and Christ interprets that the moon is indeed his church and that the dark spot on the moon is the missing feast that is necessary, that there needs to be a feast that celebrates the body of Christ in the Eucharist. Um, And so that message combined with reports of her own personal piety. And she was known by to everyone as being incredibly pious. Um, her, the vita that's written, the, the life, um, the Latin term for life is vita. So when we talk about the vitas, they mean the life of the saint. So her saint's life um, refers to her not just as having this incredible Eucharistic devotion, which is very common for female saints, um, for all female holy women in this time, but two things that are far less common um, is that it talks about her intelligence. Um, lives of female saints very rarely talk about natural intelligence. Um, that's just not one of the qualities that sadly seems to be part of 
just the way that you write a saint's life for a woman. Um, for her, the fact that her intelligence is included and that it's not a typical thing to include in a saint's life um, really speaks to this intelligence she must have had that impressed itself upon everyone who met her. Um, but she was also considered to be a prophetess, one who was able to intuit the feelings of others, one who knew about things that had happened in other parts of Europe before they were reported into Liège. Um, so when they looked into her reported vision, they also compare it to her life. I mean, as the church still does when visions are reported, you know, what is the religious life of the person reporting the vision? And Juliana's life was exemplary which is the only reason why the vision would have been approved by the theologians and the Dominicans in Liège and in the University of Paris. Um, if there had been any sign of her in her um, that she was opposed to church authority, that she opposed priestly authority, uh, this never ever would have been approved. And that would have been the major issue is, um, was how did she view priestly authority? Because the heresies that are popping up all throughout these ages, all of them are opposed to the idea of the priest as mediator between God and man. The rejection of priestly authority appears in every major um, heresy that pops up between about 12, 20, 1028 um, through the Cathar heresy of the 13th century that probably plays a role in the promulgation of Corpus Christi because the Cathars were strict dualists who denied, um, well, they denied much of basic Christian um, theology, but they absolutely denied the real presence of the Eucharist. Okay, um, and the final question there the, uh, of Corpus Christi and the miracle at Orvieto. So that's the miracle that's also on um, Bolsena. It occurs in Bolsena, and then everything is brought to Orvieto where it's verified by Pope Urban IV. So um, again, that miracle doesn't, that's not where Corpus Christi comes from, but it's something that almost certainly would have been seen by Urban IV as a final proof that he had to go ahead and approve this feast. Um, are there any other questions before we move on? Okay. If not, I'm going to go back to silencing all of you. Um, oh, I don't mute yourself when we're done with the next part. Um, so the next part, um, the medieval debate. Um, everything that happens here, the Eucharistic miracles, um, the idea of devotion to the Eucharist is important uh, because of the huge medieval debate that's going on about what the Eucharist actually is. What does the real presence mean? Um, and this is what I described earlier as the emergence of the sacramental worldview. And so we start, as I said, going back to Charlemagne, um, that area where we were, the Lotharingia, was a part of Charlemagne's empire that was divided. Um, Charlemagne had everything from France to Germany into Poland into parts of what's Hungary now. Um, his grandsons couldn't rule it also is divided into three. Um, Charles the Bald ends up having what is now France, Louis the German, I mean, his nickname is Louis the German. So he ends up getting what's now Germany. And then there was the weakest son, Lothar, who got the land in between. Um, this area, that was in between was sort of the borderland for the limits of Christianity before Charlemagne. Um, in 772, Charlemagne starts expanding east into what's now Saxony, um, that part of sort of Northern Germany. Um, and the campaign against the Saxons was brutal. The Saxons were still pagan at the time. Charlemagne conquered them in 772. Um, he forced them into Christianity and. The conversion of the Saxons is just a brutal story. Um, the idea that Christianity was forced upon natives that didn't want it, historically very, very rarely happens. The conversion of the Saxons is one of the cases in which it did because it was led by Charlemagne. Um, and Charlemagne is he's basically a Germanic warlord. 
Um, he's coming out of a Frankish world, the Merovingian kings, that's still an incredibly violent world. And his idea was he conquered this new land. He needed to make it part of his empire. And part of making it his empire was making it homogenous with the rest of the empire. And that is the they all needed to become Christians um, under penalty of death. Tribal leaders who were found to be going back and praying to pagan gods um, had their heads chopped off. And so basically every year from 772 to 804, it seemed like the Saxons would rebel. Every time there wasn't a large enough garrison left by Charlemagne, um, the Saxons would try to overthrow the Frankish overlords and establish themselves as independent. Um, by 804, after an entire generation of incredibly bloody, bitter warfare, um, the Saxons sort of give up for the last time and now they need to be converted. Um, the conversion's going to be very difficult just because of the story of a generation of what almost comes down to ethnic cleansing. So part of converting the Saxons involves sending monks into the area. In 822, uh, monks from Corby Abbey in what's well, Picardy in France, um, set up a new abbey that is New Corby in Saxony. In 831, there's this figure, Pascasius Robertus, and Pascasius, in 822, went with the monks and helped set up the new abbey. He ends up becoming abbot at the home abbey back in France. And in 831, he writes a treatise to the new abbot in Saxony. And the problem that they're having in Saxony is how do we convert these pagans? How do we get them to become good Christians? And the issue wasn't really getting the Saxons to accept Jesus. That's the easy part when you're dealing with polytheists. Polytheists are used to accepting foreign gods, especially when it's a foreign god of the people that just conquered you. If you're a polytheist, the god of the people who just conquered you is obviously a stronger god than yours, so you bring him into your pantheon. What's difficult with the Saxons is getting them to change their worldview, basically. One, from pantheism to monotheism. That Jesus isn't one of many gods who's more powerful, but that the god of Christianity is the only god. Um, and so... Pascasius sees a way to do this through explaining what the Eucharist actually is. From the time of the fall of Rome and the end of the patristic period, basically, up until this time, there's very little discussion of the Eucharist and what it actually means. Um, everybody accepted the real presence. Um, nobody doubted that. But since everybody accepted it and nobody doubted it, it wasn't something that needed to be explained. Um, you, know, you don't bother to explain things that everybody just accepts as being true. That's part of a worldview. Um, the Saxons had to adopt a new worldview, and this required having to explain how things actually work. And in Saxon pagan belief, the gods themselves were not all powerful. In any polytheistic belief, the gods are not all powerful. Um, in polytheism, the gods are subject to forces above them, the force of fate. Um, the God's power in polytheism, I'm sorry, in particularly in Saxon Nordic polytheism, came from the fact that they were able to steal the secret runes. And the secret runes, their form of writing that could be written on particular objects, had magical power about them. And the gods, having stolen these runes, then got that magical power. Um, but the gods on their own, be, by their nature, had no inherent power over the world. So the new worldview that you have to get them to accept is that of the one true God that created everything. That all of creation owes its existence to God and is inherently within God's power. So Radbertus explains the Eucharist by looking at the creative power of God in Genesis. Um, when God says, fiat lux, let there be light, and there is light. This is something that to the Saxons doesn't make sense. Um, that through a simple spoken word, God commands, God creates. Um, 
but by focusing on this is what our God does. He doesn't have to steal words from somewhere else. He doesn't obtain power over matter. He creates matter, and he creates matter with the spoken word itself. So the connection then, once you've gotten the Saxons to accept this idea of a God that is infinitely more powerful than anything they had, which was an idea that's attractive, that there is a God more powerful than what you have, and that sort of explains why you lost. Um, you can then go from the words fiat lux to hoc est corpus meum, this is my body. So the words that Christ speaks that are repeated by the priest at consecration that transforms the bread into the body of Christ. The mechanism by which this works is the spoken word. And so, and this was something that Augustine had brought up as well. When you're looking at the transformation of bread into the body of Christ, the real miracle isn't the consecration. The miracle is creation to begin with. The God that created matter is certainly capable of changing one kind of matter into another once it already exists. Um, so Radbertus writes this work that he titles De Corpore et Sanguine Domini, um, On the Body and Blood of the Lord. And it's intended, again, for the instruction of Saxon converts. Um, and what he's trying to do in this is build up what is basically the sacramental worldview, that the certainty that we can have that when the priest says these words, the bread becomes the body of Christ, which to a pagan Saxon makes no sense at all. That simply through words that a priest, that the priest speaks, there's a transformation that occurs that you can't witness. Haskazius ties the reality of that change by having them go back and think about the original creation. So what he's interested in doing is authenticating this ever-present historical reality. And this is the sacramental worldview, that everything in creation serves a purpose, relates to that purpose, and by understanding this, we can come closer to understanding God. So that, and this is the mistake that's made later on by people who criticize him, you're not, you're not redoing that sacrifice. Christ isn't being sacrificed again. Um, the ordinary rules of time and space don't apply to divinity. Um, what happens in salvation history is something that through these words we represent. Um, we're not redoing the sacrifice, we're representing the original sacrifice. And so that's what Radbert is, is doing here, is trying to create this sacramental worldview amongst the Saxons so that they can understand everything else. Um, while this is going on, one of the monks at his own abbey, Retramnus, um, is reading what Pascasius writes and just completely disagrees with it. Sometime it's thought around maybe um, 843, and all of these dates are best guesses. Um, when we're in this period, almost none of these dates can be verified for certain. Um, but Charles the Bald visits the Abbey, and Charles the Bald, um, he's doing his best to be a good king of France, um, but he's also certainly not a theologian, and so he asks Retramnus to explain to him what's actually happening in the consecration. And Retramnus uses this opportunity um, to write his own De Corpore a Sanguine Domini. Um, 859 is one of the dates that we have for this work. Um, but again, it's anywhere between 843 and 859 that the original um, impetus behind this, answering the questions of Charles the Bald about what actually happens. Um, and so Charles the Bald had a couple of questions that he wanted answered. Number one, is the Eucharist the historical body and blood of Christ? And then number two, in what manner is the Eucharist the body and blood? Um, in mystery or in truth? That is, in mysterio, on in veritate, in the Latin. Um, and Retramnus just gives a flat out no, that the Eucharist is not the historical body and blood of Christ. To the second question, he answers sort of in both. What Retramnus thought he was doing is he thought that Radbertus was being kind of crudely material, that he was being slavishly literal. 
And Ratramnus thought that he was sort of resurrecting this spiritual element of St. Augustine's thought that Radbertus had simply abandoned. So whereas Radbertus was trying to convert the Saxons and give them a new worldview, Ratramnus is looking at the question very much in intellectual terms. And what he thinks is that Radbertus has intellectually shortchanged this tradition. And by intellectually shortchanging it, he's come up with something that's grossly material and lacks this spiritual element to it. And so he recognizes an intellectual problem that needs to be solved intellectually. And the intellectual tools that he basically has are one of grammar. Um, and so he's applying these words that come out of Augustine, out of the patristic tradition, figura or obvelatio. And figura um, literally is figure. It's sometimes also you, meaning type. It's a kind of allegory in which one thing indicates something else. Um, I can easily spend 10 minutes talking about what Augustine means by figura, but we don't have that time. So I'm going to kind of stop myself here. Um, and so basically, Ratramnus puts the entire question about, is the Eucharist, how is Christ present in the Eucharist? Is he there simply as a is the Eucharist a, re a representation of the body and blood as a figura, something that points to a truth in something else? Or is the Eucharist simple truth? What he describes as veritatis nuda manifestatio, a manifestation of nude, simple truth itself. Um, and Ratramnus, looking, interpreting the Bible, says, you know, when Christ says, I am the bread of life, Christ doesn't mean that he's a literal loaf of bread. He means something in a figural sense. Pure truth for Ratramnus is something like the nativity, the crucifixion, the resurrection, where things are exactly what they seem to be, exactly, more importantly, what they appear to be. Because for Ratramnus, the difference between appearance and reality is different than the way that Radbertus saw it. Um, what Ratramnus had to say wouldn't have really been that important. It wasn't taken up by other thinkers. Um, Radbertus's idea becomes sort of the standard explanation of the Eucharist um, up until the middle of the 11th century. Um, that's when this figure, Berengar of Tours, comes along. And the 11th century is one in which education is sort of revitalized. Um, there's more sources that are available. The work of translating lost Greek works that are now available through the Greek, sometimes through Arabic, that's beginning in the 11th century. And the use of intellectual tools, similar to what Ratram has done, that becomes incredibly popular in the 11th century. And so Berengar is going through this um, and he writes a letter correcting somebody else's explanation of the Eucharist, which had been taken from Radbertus's idea. And so Berenger basically wants to show off his intellectual chops. Um, if you can think of the professor that is so puffed up on his own ego that the lecture turns into the professor talking about themselves and their own brilliance, that is Berenger. That is not something that's new to the 20th century. That has always been there in Western history. Um, Berengar of Tours is one of the first of these that you can draw a direct line to whichever professor you remember from your own university experience that you hate because all they ever did was talk about themselves. That's Berengar of Tours. Um, so he wants to pick up this idea of what Augustine meant in Sacre. Um, what Augustine describes as a sacrum signum, a holy sign. A, a holy sign requires a race and a signum. The race in Latin is the thing. Uh, it's just the word that means thing. The thing itself is the race, and the signum is the sign that points to it. So what Berenger is saying, logically, if the Eucharist is a sacrament, that means it's a sacrum signum. That means the Eucharist itself is a signum that points to something else. 
the race itself cannot be contained within the signum. So what Berenger is saying, the, gram, the simple grammar of Christ's statement of our understanding of the Eucharist do not allow the interpretation that Christ is materially, physically present in the Eucharist itself. Um, when Christ says, hoc est corpus meum, this is my body. If the bread is transformed completely into his body, and this is just an example of how Berenger thinks through this, the pronoun hawk, this, cannot refer to the bread. If you're holding up the bread and saying hawk, if it's being completely transformed into the body, then the pronoun makes no sense because grammatically it can only refer to substance or accidents, but it can't refer to both. So it can't be both the material bread that you see before you um, and what it points to at the same point in time. It's this really weird grammar, logical, grammar and logic applied to theology that he's doing that other people aren't doing. Um, but in order to refute him, everybody who disagrees with him basically ends up having to do the same thing. So 11th and 12th century theology, um, it takes this kind of bizarre turn where Aristotelian logic and ideals of grammar are being applied to the Bible. Sometimes the results are illuminating, sometimes the results um, are insane, um, and this is where education goes in the 11th century. So for Beringer, as he's looking at this, what he says, the transformation that occurs in the bread is that the bread becomes the figura. It becomes the figure that um, is a sign for Christ spiritually or intellectually. So Beringer claims that he believes in the real presence, but he doesn't believe that Christ is physically present in the Eucharist. He's only there spiritually or intellectually. That um, what happens is that you go from having just bread that's its own res. The bread then becomes a figure, but the rest that it points to is Christ who's physically in heaven. Um, there's a couple of points that Beringer makes that are important because Aquinas comes back to these specifically in his liturgy. Um, what he sees as some of the absurdities in believing that the Eucharist physically becomes Christ um, is that when you break the Eucharistic host, that means that you're breaking Christ's body, that bits fall off of the host. Um, those are bits of Christ's body, that Christ's body is divided. Um, which he sees as an absurdity. And then furthermore, that Christ is physically at the right hand of the Father in heaven. Um, for Beringer, the this idea of transubstantiation would require that Christ physically come back down to earth. Basically, what Beringer has here is he's adapting a kind of a naturalist worldview in his desire to maintain a symbolic worldview, the symbolic worldview that had dominated from the end of, from the time of Augustine, basically until the 10th century, um, where you look at the world and everything is a sign of something else. Um, the symbolic worldview, it's, it's based on a bad version of Augustine's distinction between things and signs. Everything in the material world becomes a sign that points to a spiritual reality. Um, but in the symbolic mode of looking at the world, the material things lose all actual um, significance on their own. I mean, literally, they're just signifying something else. Um, whatever you see on earth is just a symbol for some spiritual reality. The material world itself um, is nothing more than an opportunity for intellectual contemplation. Beringer starts with that, and then we're kind of going into this natural worldview that his opponents will fully develop, where we start looking at things in reality, and we're no longer interested in a moral connection between the thing and what it signifies. What we're now looking at is the real connection between how a thing appears what Aristotle would call its accidents, and what a thing actually is in its essence. Um, it's a substance is a form, is matter in some kind of a form. 
in the realist view, which is what Beringer's opponents basically take up to argue that Christ is really present, um, we're led into an almost material position about reality itself. Um, so Beringer was, his views were seen as heretical within his own life. Um, he was repeatedly condemned. Like most intellectuals who are puffed up on themselves, when he was, he was summoned to Rome, of course, to give an account for his views. Um, he thought that he was going to go to Rome and that there would be this great intellectual debate and he would convince everybody that he was right. Um, and then he would be recognized as the greatest thinker in the world. Um, what happened, of course, is that he went to Rome and it was already decided that his views were heretical. And he was only called there so that he could just, you know, sign um, his, he had to recant his views. Um, when he realized that's what happened, um, when you deny the intellectual the opportunity to explain their viewpoints, that's about the worst thing that you can do to them. So he goes back to France and um, he immediately goes back to teaching his previous viewpoints. And by teaching these previous viewpoints, you know, he summons up all of the theologians into trying to find a way to argue against him. What's important here, though, is that basically to argue with Beringer, you had to pick up his intellectual tools. And this sets us on the track that eventually will lead to Aquinas um, using Aristotelian logic and Aristotelian physics and metaphysics with Christianity to come up with an explanation of transubstantiation that goes beyond pure materialism. Um, and these are basically the notes going over um, what I just said. So once again, we'll take another pause um, for whatever questions that we have here. Um, try not to get too lost in the metaphysics of this. This is really just to sort of establish what was at stake was really the understanding of the Eucharist itself. One of the unfortunate things about the way that um, Retramnus decided that he was going to explain Augustine to everyone is that Augustine didn't, Augustine never gave a systematic explanation of how the sacrament, of, of what the sacrament in the Eucharist was. So you have Retramnus coming in and deciding that he's going to go ahead and explain what Augustine really meant when Augustine never actually said that. Um, Augustine, as quoted by Peter Lombard, who's writing the sentences in the 12th century. If you ask how this can be so, I shall briefly tell you. A mystery of faith can be profitably believed. It cannot be profitably explained. So of the mystery of the Eucharist of transubstantiation at some point in time has to remain mysterious. Um, it has to remain an actual mystery. Um, the question is, how much explanation can we do to make it coherent um, before we get to the point of mystery. Oh, if you have any questions, um, I'll allow you to unmute yourselves now. Yeah, I also teach high school and um, a couple of years ago when we had the COVID shutdowns. Um, had to spend, I teach at Holy Family High School in Broomfield, and when, for the last, you know, six weeks of school, we had to do it all online, um, and when I realized that I could silence a room full of teenagers with the mute all button, that was one of my happiest moments teaching ever, and when we, I, mean, I was very happy that we got to go back into the classroom the next year, you know, at Holy Family, we spent all of, um, 2020, 2021 in the classroom, which was wonderful, but I definitely missed that mute all button. I still miss that mute all button. Okay, and since there weren't any immediate questions about exactly what it is that Retramnus and Radbertus are discussing, I am going to happily zoom right past the um, quibbling over particular terms. Uh, but I do want us to remember that word figura. Um, it becomes important, and Aquinas uses it very specifically. Um, and 
what Retramnus had objected to about what would happen is you're breaking the Eucharist that um, to fracture. Um, fracture is the Latin word that we have that will appear again and again um, in Aquinas's work. Aquinas is his poetry specifically responds to these particular intellectual critiques, which is why I took the major risk of boring you all to tears and having you drop out by going over 300 years of very dense theological speculation. With that done, um, we'll move on to medieval piety and the Eucharist. Um, and what happens in the 12th and 13th centuries? Um, and what happens in the 12th and 13th centuries is the Eucharist and particularly the moment of consecration becomes the focal point of religious life in the Western church. Um, in the early Middle Ages, that wasn't really the case. Um, in the early Middle Ages, the cult of relics was more important uh, for individual personal devotion. And part of that had to do with the mass. Um, the mass at the time was, almost, was spoken almost in a whisper by the priest with his back to um, the laity. And the laity during the mass would mostly be involved in private devotions um, if they weren't daydreaming. It's in the 12th century that the interest in the Eucharist becomes paramount, that the cult of the relics, the cult of the relics of course never goes away. We still have that with us today and the, and the cult of the relics is a good thing. Um, but the Eucharist, the idea of literally God is present with us, takes on the central importance that it should have. Um, and if there's anything that's applicable to us today, right now in this moment, as we go into this year of Eucharistic revival, um, I hope it's a meditation on our own relationship to the Eucharist um, and what that relationship was. And what that relationship was in the Middle Ages, we start off with a time in which it simply does not have the importance that it has today. Um, and communion itself was taken um, in different ways. Sometimes communion uh, would occur some, sometimes after the mass was finished, um, sometimes before that the priests and the other um, clerics would take Eucharist, but for um, the laity that wanted the Eucharist, um, that was done separately. It's this 11th and 12th century that transforms the liturgy, that makes the liturgy what we recognize today. Um, it's not too far to say that. Um, and you can see this bit by bit in the material culture of the church. Um, in the early church, or the early medieval church, um, consecrated hosts that were reserved after mass because you, know, you would need them um, for the sick if you were, if you were one of the churches that had the habit of giving communion to the laity before church, you needed obviously the consecrated hosts before the mass was done. Um, they were quite often reserved um, simply on a patent in the vestry. Um, pixes, um, the pix, which just comes from the Greek word for a boxwood box. Um, these become increasingly important. Originally, they had just been used to transport the consecrated hosts to the sick. They come to be the ordinary receptacles for holding the consecrated hosts within the church. Um, and in England and Northern Europe in particularly, um, they come up with a system where they have these hanging pyxes. So the pyx is hanging above the altar from a rope and it would be put on a pulley so that you could pull it up and down as necessary, you, you put the consecrated hosts into the picks and lock it, um, a requirement that comes out of the 12th century with the increased importance of the Eucharist um, is that the Eucharist be, be treated with the reverence that it deserves, that this is Christ with us, this is God. Um, and then so simply to leave it around um, unattended in a church is hardly fitting. So the pyx was required then to have a lock on it and it could be pulled back up above the altar um, and there would be a kerchief or um, some kind of an, an almost, a, a veil that would be put over top of it. And then one of the other developments that we start seeing um, 
is that cut into the northern walls. The traditional way of doing churches is to have the altar facing east. So on the left-hand side, the northern wall of the church, um, or in churches that were obverse having the altar in the other direction, um, the northern wall was still more typical. They would start to create um, these stone containers, these stone receptacles um, that the Eucharist could be put into. Um, and as the Eucharist becomes more and more important, they would actually cut windows um, through the masonry of the church itself, so that as you are on the outside of the church, you could actually see the Eucharist, you could venerate the Eucharist without having to come into the church itself. Um, so people passing by on horseback. There's stories of knights particularly appreciating these oculi, this, this window. Uh, because the knights felt it was appropriate that their horses, and what's more important to a knight than his horse, uh, the knights felt it was important that the horse in whatever animal equine way possible could also venerate the Eucharist. But if you think about that for just a moment, the jump that, it, that we're going in from the cult of relics to my horse itself needs to be able to see the Eucharist, the centrality that that has in your spirituality, um, if the most important thing to you as a knight is your horse, that your horse needs to be able to, again, in its own equine way, venerate the Eucharist itself. Um, the elevation of the host. This is something that pops up at the very end of the 12th century. Before this, um, at the consecration, the priest leaned over, as they still do today, um, at the words, Hocus corpus man, this is my body. Um, but then they just went right on. In Throughout the 12th century, this had to have started, it seems to have started in France. The first record that we have is 1198, Bishop Odo of Paris gave a specific instruction to all the clergy in the diocese that after leaning forward and saying the words Hulk est, um, Hulk est corpus meus, that they had to elevate the host so that the entire laity could see it. Um, and so medieval illustrations, uh, medieval manuscripts are filled with images of this, the moment of elevation. Why does this elevation matter? Because after those words of consecration, it's not the host, it is God, it, you, that Jesus is present with us. You're putting that up in the air so that the laity can see it, so that the laity have this chance to stare at Christ. Um, if you've been to a seas, um, you probably, unless you have a photographic memory or you're an art history major who wanted to remember everything there, um, there's this image from 1325 painted by Simone Martini um, that this is the elevation. Um, so, you know, a century after what we're talking about here, um, this elevation is still such the supremely important moment. You see the angels are coming down and assisting in this moment. And behind him, um, you have someone holding an elevation candle. Um, and we'll talk about the candles and their importance in just a minute. Um, by 1243, the Franciscans have officially included this instruction on the elevation that the host must be held up for all to see. The Dominicans follow in 1256 by the, towards the second half of the 13th century. Um, the practice of elevation seems to be universal in the Western church. Um, and along with that um, comes other forms of showing the dignity of the moment. In 1225, there's an English diocese that in its statute states that everyone needs to kneel during consecration. Um, before this, it seems that standing throughout the entire service seems to have been the norm, um, but kneeling during a consecration comes into play at this time as well, um, as do the actions of genuflecting um, seemingly for the first time. Why the candles? Um, and this has to do with, I mean, yes, it is, the candles are appropriate for the dignity of the moment, but it also relates, I think, to a way that in the Middle Ages, uh, feasting itself is understood, because of course the Eucharist is the great feast. Um, if you read any medieval literature, and there's a description of a feast, or you read anything written in the Middle Ages, one of the things that is just so odd, you don't, you don't even notice it at first, 
But you realize that when they describe feast, they never ever describe how the food actually tastes. Um, when a medieval feast is described, all of the other senses are described. Uh, you have to have music. You have to have beautiful sounds. You have to have beautiful images. Um, there'll be great descriptions of the place settings. Um, if cutlery is used, the beauty of the cutlery itself, what people are wearing, because of course, for the feast, you dress up in your finest clothes. Um, the visual pageantry of the moment is described. The perfumes and incense, um, the sweet smells that are coming out of this, this almost sensory overload. Um, but bizarrely, taste is not described. And the visual importance of food is such that based on some of the recipes that we have, the colors were so important that they would use things that would bring out great colors, even if it seems that it would have a negative impact, a impact on the taste that they were looking for. Um, so the basic idea of the feast in the Middle Ages is that it's a sensory feast for all of the senses. Taste is almost considered last in this. Um, and as the Eucharist becomes a focus of devotion, um, and I'm not saying it was consciously modeled on this, but it's just something about the medieval world that um, we have to consider. All of the senses become involved in the moment of consecration as well. Um, this is when incense um, is added to the consecration, bells, and both sets of bells. The main bells that you can hear throughout the town, those would be rung so that the entire parish would recognize what was occurring at this moment, um, that Christ is about to be present with us. And then what are called the sacring bells, the small bells that you have within the church. Um, those would be rung in announcement of what was happening. Um, elevation candles are included. And uh, we keep in mind that medieval churches, of course, are mostly lit by candles for the moment of consecration. Special candles called these elevation candles um, are decreed. And, that, and that's what um, is being held here, is the particular elevation candle that's lit for this precise moment. And what the faithful recognize in this moment is literally the presence of God. And they appreciate that moment with a sincerity and freshness because it's a new understanding. Um, so simply seeing the elevation itself almost becomes a minor sacrament. Um, there's places where it's described as spiritual communion, um, that if you are present in this moment, if you see the elevation, you have this earthly vision of Christ. Um, it was never considered to be equal to actually partaking in communion. Um, so please don't get me wrong on that. It was never seen to be equal. But it was incredibly spiritually meaningful. Um, and in certain cases, it was better because you did not run into the danger of unworthy reception. And this is where I think we've lost something that, of course, you're supposed to be in a state of grace. You're not supposed to have mortal sin on you to receive the Eucharist. Um, but receiving the Eucharist, I think today has become almost mechanical and automatic within churches in a way that it definitely would not have been in the Middle Ages. Um, it wasn't simply a, oh, okay, this is what I do now. So for anybody who was concerned about being marked with sin that had not been absolved, the spiritual communion of seeing was this spiritually meaningful moment, this vision of God that didn't come with it the danger uh, and they took very seriously that line that, you know, the one who eats unworthily, you know, eats their own perdition. Um, it didn't involve that risk. And so we'll go back to that area of Lotharingia, which um, may, maybe the Rhineland would just be the better term for it today, um, that had, that would seems to be, have been home to so many of these spiritually devout women. Um, there's reports of the women that would literally run from church to church throughout a city, trying to be present at each church individually for the moment of elevation. 
to have that image of that vision of Christ as much as possible. Um, and in the 14th century, when this feast is made universal again, um, this visual communion is so popular that it kind of results in um, trying to think of a way of saying this without calling it a spinoff. Please excuse the, um, the kind of cheapening term to call it a spinoff, but that's basically um, what Eucharistic adoration and processions become is this opportunity for this viewing of Christ that's disconnected from the mass itself, because that's basically what some of these women had been doing in practice is they're not staying through any of the masses um, from start to finish. They're running from mass to mass trying to be there just at this moment. So the idea that comes out of the 14th century um, that becomes immensely popular is the Corpus Christi procession. Um, and this is where we also have the introduction of the monsters, um, that device which holds the consecrated host with clear glass so that it can be seen. So what everybody wanted was that vision of God. And I remember um, so my wife did not, Eucharistic adoration simply was not a thing. Um, in the church that she grew up in. Um, so, and she also works with me at Holy Family. And when we had our first Eucharistic adoration at Holy Family, um, I was explaining to her what it was and her response, which I just absolutely loved was, oh, it's space time with Jesus. Um, and, you know, after overcoming the, okay, we're describing Eucharistic adoration with a metaphor that comes from cell phones. And whenever we talk about cell phones in a spiritual setting, it's always the dangers of cell phones, right? Um, but in this case, it was absolutely right. That's the perfect metaphor, that that's exactly what Eucharistic adoration is. Um, and if we can take that idea of FaceTime with Christ um, and then transport ourselves into a world where that's available for the first time. Um, and perhaps by thinking about what it would mean to have that experience of that vision of Christ that you didn't have access to previously, we can recover that na naive here in a good sense that is not exposed to it before, that naive wonder of what is literally the awesome, the awe-inspiring. Um, the awful in the literal sense of filled with awe experience of standing, seeing Christ before you. Um, and I think that's a good note to pause on here. And well, I think I was, oh yeah, and along those lines, we'll, we'll continue. The natural follow-up to this is communion um, in the 13th and 14th century, that it was far less common than it was today. Um, it was not something that the laity automatically did. Um, quite often it was understood that the priest could take communion as a mediator for his parishioners, um, that the priest would take communion for his people. Um, the Fourth Lateran Council mandated that it had to be received once a year. Um, if it's saying that it has to be received once a year, um, that tells you something about how commonly it was received. And before that, there's reports um, that it was encouraged that the laity only receive it on Easter, Pentecost, and Christmas. Um, some contemporaries noticed the decreasing frequency of communion that they had saw within their own lifespan. Yeah. And interestingly enough, it's right around this time that you also have um, the Dominicans and Franciscan order, many of whom were devotees of frequent, even daily communion. Um, but we shouldn't see the lack of frequent communion as a lack of devotion or spiritual interest. Um, it's recognizing the literal awesome nature of the Eucharist, um, the, re the reality of consecration bred into God. With that great sense of awe comes that fear of being an unworthy recipient. Um, so when the so the it's precisely I think because the Eucharist is understood in this new sense that is so filled with spiritual wonder and majesty that the reception of it becomes less frequent 
and the viewing kind of fills that space. Now, it's not as, for the most part, you, the laity were not um, encouraged not to take the communion. Um, I'm sure I could find bits and pieces here or there where particular individuals would say, no, it's not necessary for them. But in general, it's not something where they were dissuaded from taking um, communion. But the sense of awe, the sense of the proper place that you need to be in to receive this is was much more great, was felt to a much greater level um, on a much more, I think we acknowledge it intellectually today, but I'm not sure all of us, and I'm including myself in this, of course, um, every time that we take communion, do we have that profound reflection on our own spiritual state at that time? And in the Middle Ages, they did. And that's why viewing becomes so important, because it's this access to God without the fear of self-condemnation by being an unworthy recipient. Um, and that's where I'll stop this section before we move on to Aquinas's liturgy. Okay, so um, in the chat, uh, one question, does viewing the elevated host give you special grace? I am going to avoid that question just on principle because this is, I forgot to give this warning at the beginning, but I always do to my other classes. I am not a theologian. That is not my training. Um, my training is as a medievalist, um, comparative literature and intellectual history. So I'm very happy to talk about the historical practices and their significances at the time, um, but to avoid stepping into a field that is not my own, that would be contemporary theology and especially questions of faith and morals. Um, I'm going to defer the question about viewing the elevated host to someone that is properly trained in that. Um, and yeah, if anybody who's interested in these notes, I'll happily share them. Um, I have these as Google Slides. I can probably just turn them into a PDF file and I'll share those PDFs to anyone who's interested. Um, the, oh, so the hosts themselves. Yeah, and this is an interesting question. Um, the hosts were made of unleavened bread um, and they were made in, um, that's sort of the format that we're familiar with today, the kind of the thin wafer, that goes back to at least the ninth century. Um, and they were stamped, they had insignia on them. The most common would be just a cross um, or an IHS or one of the basic symbols. But in the, in, in the 12th and 13th centuries, just as this is becoming more important, we also like to, we also begin to see more complicated images that are stamped onto the hosts. Um, a, the face of Christ, the face, a crucifixion scene itself are stamped onto these hosts. And in the earliest church, they broke the bread and shared wine. Did they view the bread and wine as the real presence um, or more as a spiritual presence? Um, so the early church, almost universally saw it as the real presence. Um, there are a few early patristic writers that talk about the spiritual presence. Um, Tertullian, I think, but I'm not positive on that. And again, here I'll pause. I'm not a patristic scholar either. Um, but the belief of the church as a whole from the beginning has always been on the real presence. Um, The question I'll uh, for those who ask it is, what exactly does the real presence mean? Um, Berenger thought he believed in real presence, but what he believed in was the spiritual intellectual reality that we would not regard as the real presence. Can I ask a, a question? It's too long for the chat. Certainly. Concerning what Art just asked and your clarification on that, I still find myself a little bit confused about what you said in the first section on the history. And I don't remember the, the folks' names, but kind of looking at the natural, like, okay, this host, you know, saying, okay, it's not Jesus come down because we break it in half and 
we lose little pieces. But isn't that kind of true in a way? Because the priest is so incredibly careful about cleaning that patent and making sure if the host lands on the ground, it's taken oh, care of. So, I mean, isn't it really real anyway? Yes. What, and so the clarification here is about what happens when you break this. What about the individual pieces? What Berengar of Tours was saying is that if you broke the piece, you would, because he sees this, he understands this in a very material way. What Berengar of Tours was saying is that if you have just a crumb that falls off, that crumb is just a part of Jesus. It's not all of Jesus. Um, it's. Okay, I think I understand. Yeah, it's, uh, yeah. It's right, all. so I mean, if you break it in half, all. you're somehow breaking Christ's body. Part of Christ's body is here and part of Christ's body is there. Um, and when we talk, and I'm glad that you asked this clarifying question. Um, so when we talk about that, the sacramental worldview, um, it's that Christ is physically present, but not in that gross material way where this part of it is a finger. And if we lose a crumb over there, there goes a Tony. Um, and this is something that Aquinas is extremely explicit about in what he writes, that Christ, and this is the belief I'm almost positive, I'm not a theologian, I'm almost positive this is the, the proper belief, uh, that Christ is fully present in each part of the consecrated host. In all consecrated hosts, Christ is fully present, which is why there is um, today so much concern, you're so careful about the crumbs and all of it has to be consumed because each piece is fully Christ. So what you're saying is correct. And what Berengar was saying was his own, um, oddly enough, he was criticizing others for being crudely materialistic when he himself was the one that was guilty of the crude materialism. And it's funny how often that happens, especially when you're dealing with the um, rock star professors. And he was definitely one of those. And if you're familiar with the story of Abelard and Eloise, um, Abelard is, he didn't, I don't believe he studied, there's any proof that he studied under Berengar of Tours, but he's sort of the spiritual successor in terms of um, the guy who's so smart that he knows everything and he's not going to be corrected by anybody. Um, and yeah, and Berengar had to denounce his belief um, as Abelard would later on. Um, the difference is that when Abelard had to denounce his belief, he did his best that he could not to end up repeating his belief. Um, when Berengar denounced his belief, he was so upset about the way that he was treated that he went back and just continued teaching exactly what he had been teaching before. Okay, and with that, I think we're ready to move on to the last section here, which is Aquinas's liturgy. So I get to go back to the mute all and do not let themselves turn turn themselves back on. Um, so the hymns that Aquinas writes for the liturgy: um, Pange lingua gloriosi, sacri solemnis, verbum supernum prodiens, and laudesi and salvatorum. Um, you might recognize these titles. What would be far more likely is that you recognize individual um, verses from this because it's, some, I'm sorry, individual stanzas, because it's stanzas taken from these hymns that we still use today in Eucharistic adoration. Um, so again, um, Aquinas, and here's our image, um, which I've used as my background image for this. Um, Aquinas presents the office of Corpus Christi to Pope Urban IV. Um, and this was this is painted about 100 years after the fact. There's something fantastic when you look at um, medieval paintings. You can always figure out what's going on by looking at people's hands. Um, and he's presenting it here and you can see this cardinal signifying, you know, this is what you got to be looking at. This is the important part. Um, so, Pange Lingua Gloriosi, um, this is recognized, the final two stanzas are Tantum Ergo, Tantum Ergo Sacramentum, that, those two stanzas 
are used as the first hymn in benediction at uh, Eucharistic Adoration. Um, the entire hymn was used as the hymn for Vespers. Um, so I'm presenting these with Aquinas' original, the 19th century translation of J.M. Neal, um, his translations might still be the best in terms of keeping in mind that this is something that has to be sung. And so trying to find a way that sticks to what Aquinas is saying while still having it be something that you can sing. Um, and medieval hymns, they're the songs that go with them are almost interchangeable because there's only a few meters that they use. Um, and they're just represented by numbers. Um, the most common is an eight beat line, sometimes an eight beat line followed by a seven beat line. So pange lingua gloriosi is your eight beat line, corporis mysterium, um, followed up by a seven beat line. What Aquinas does here is he is borrowing the opening line from an even more ancient hymn. Um, Fortuna Venetiatus Fortunatus in the sixth century wrote a hymn that is um, that was about that he wrote in um, sorry. His city of Poitiers was able to get a relic of the true cross. And when that relic of the true cross was brought into France, um, this ancient poet, um, Fortunatus, wrote a couple of hymns for it. And the one that he, his version of Pange Lingua um, was written according to the meter that would be used to write songs for military triumphs. So Fortunatus has the cross coming into the relic of the cross coming in, and he celebrates it as a military triumph. The cross that, you know, the image of what had been execution becomes a sign of victory. So Aquinas, for his Vespers limb, cites a line that goes back immediately to that poem um, and brings us into that thought of victory. Um, this has been described as just one of the most sublime productions of sacred poetry ever. Um, and as much as I would like to read it word by word in the original Latin, I'm not sure I would have time to do that and go through all of the hymns that I would like to see. Um, one of the reasons that it was somewhat doubted that Aquinas wrote these um, is that it's such beautiful poetry. It's such beautiful poetry and you just don't think of Aquinas that way. You think of Aquinas as the author, if you've tried to read the Summa Theologica um, or the Summa Contra Gentiles or basically anything Aquinas writes, um, he is a dense author. Um, he writes in a very compact style. He expects you to be able to follow him and his arguments. He expects you to know who he's citing and why. Um, medieval philosophy and theology has been described as kind of like an insect. It's hard the way an insect is because all of the structure is on the outside. Um, Aquinas, when he's writing theology, he's not trying to seduce you with a beautifully written essay. He's telling you exactly what he's going to write bit by bit. Argument one, argument two, argument three. Response to one, response to two, response to three. My response to the whole question, responses to other objections, et cetera, et cetera. So the idea that somebody who writes in that style could write these poems that are just so absolutely beautiful. Um, and I will make sure that when I send this out, I will also include links to recordings of these. I'm sure I can find some on YouTube. Um, but I will definitely include recording so that you can actually hear the music because I can't just present hymns to you. It needs to be heard with the music. Um, and of course, the music is somewhat interchangeable um, because all it has to be is a melody that fits the particular line that he's writing in. And since the lines that he's writing, and there's only a few of them, you have a lot of melodies that can be fit to a lot of different songs. Um, yeah. 
but we start um we start at the beginning of this um and the beginning being the incarnation then we go back to the fructus ventris generosi um that noble generosity here, um, not generous in the modern sense. Um, generous in the modern sense comes from its old meaning of being noble. Um, so we have the purpose of the incarnation that leads to the crucifixion. But before we get to the crucifixion, we have this image that um, appears so often throughout the liturgy that he's written for Corpus Christi about um, the Last Supper. And I hadn't mentioned this before. One of the important things about Corpus Christi is that it's explicitly meant to be seen as a companion to Holy Thursday. Um, in the bull that's written, um, in actually in Christ's explanation to Juliana, as is recorded in her life, Christ explains that this is connected to Holy Thursday, but on Holy Thursday in the church, the church has other concerns, washing the feet of paupers. Um, preparing herself to, for the passion, um, for the sorrow that lies ahead. And so now it's time after the victory, after the resurrection, after the ascension, after Pentecost, after all of that, now it's time to go back to the institution of the Eucharist. And we have this connection to Holy Thursday that comes out where we're not saddened by knowing what's going to happen on Good Friday, we're looking at the incredible generosity of Christ giving himself that I, he, he comes to save us. And the particular way in which he saves us is this incredible sacrifice. Um, and, he's, and he's handing himself over his body that he's handing over to his disciples here. Um, just this, the in James Quinn's translation here, on that Paschal evening, see him with the chosen 12 recline to the old law still obedient in its feasts of love divine, love divine, the new law giving, gives himself as bread and wine. Um, the word play, to call it word play kind of sounds like a cheap trick, but it really isn't. Um, Aquinas is using words that are so pregnant with meaning to create associations um, that are clearly within the concept that he's trying to describe. Um, I mean, if you just look at what he does with the words in the fourth verse there, verbum carnal panum verum, verbo carnum efficit. Um, by his word, the word almighty makes bread of his flesh indeed, uh, literally makes true bread, or makes true bread into his flesh with his word. Um, the word made flesh verbo by the means of his spoken word. Fitque sanguis Christi merum, et si sensus deficit, ad fermandum cor sincerum, sola fide su suficit. And here we come into the mystery of what we have here, the physicality of Christ, but in a non-material, a non-phenomenal way, a way that cannot be picked up through the ordinary way of knowing. The, and Aquinas describes this all throughout everywhere else. The ordinary way of knowing things in this world begins with the senses. Um, but here that can't happen if the senses fail to see faith alone, the true heart waketh to behold the mystery. And then we have the stanzas that are used in benediction, tantum ergo sacramentum. Um, Therefore, before him bending, this great sacrament revere, pipes and shadows have their ending, for the newer rite is here. Faith, our outward sense befriending, make the inward vision clear. Pipes and shadows, the words that Neil uses translating here are not literally what Aquinas is saying. What Aquinas says is antiquum documentum, and documentum there doesn't mean document. Um, it means something like the... Um, Example setting precedent would be the meaning of documentum there. But types, um, type is another word for figure. Typology is the other term for figural interpretation. Um, and this is one of the standard ways of understanding the Old Testament is that figures in the Old Testament are figures or types of Christ. 
um, that you see in their action something that indicates Christ, that Jonah is a type of Christ. He spends three days in the whale, which is a historical reality, but also points to the three days that Christ will spend in the tomb. That's a type or a figure. Um, Aquinas doesn't use that word here, but it's something that he comes up with again and again. Um, and shadow there, um, umbra for Aquinas, is what the type or figure does. It's a shadow that um, doesn't allow you to see the full meaning itself, or it's something that's put in figural understanding, um, has this veil over top of it, or a shadow. So Neil has understood the sense of what Aquinas is doing all throughout, and he's taken a bit of liberty here with that description. And to try to get through all of these in the remaining time, I would love to be able to read the Latin on all of these, but again, I think I prepared a four hour lecture that I'm having to cram down to two. Um, Sacra Solemnis, um, this is the hymn for the Office of Readings. Of the hymn that he wrote, this is the least known one, um, but it does include a couple stanzas, Panis Angelicus, the Bread of Angels. That piece has been separately set to music basically since this was written. There's numerous Renaissance Baroque settings. Um, there's even a recording that Andrea Botticelli, uh, Andrea Bocelli did um, just a few years ago of um, Panis Angelicus. Um, again, can't go through the whole thing. Um, and if the last poem kind of is a wine is having some philosophy, but having a bit more effective poetry, um, showing Christ amongst his disciples, this one even more so, um, is getting away from the heavy theology and more the effective reality of Christ with his friends that he's about to leave. Sorry. Post agnum typicum. When he's using that word typicum there, um, he's using that in the previous sense of um, figure. So where Neil had translated something as types, this is that Latin word typicum, post agnum typicum. So we remember that they're sitting down to um, the Passover feast. So lamb would have been part of that. So the agnum typicum. They ate lamb. That's the historical fact, but the fact that they're eating lamb also points to something else. The literal lamb, it has its own reality. It's not just a symbol, but it also points to the lamb of God that's going to be sacrificed for all. And that's the typicum that um, Aquinas draws in here. He's showing out what is the proper understanding of these figures and types when we're looking at the Eucharist. The bread of the Eucharist is not a figure. Um, the Lamb that was eaten at the Last Supper, that is a figure of the sacrifice to come. Um, and these lines here that are translated, um, by those hands so blessed unto each single guest, even to all was the whole Christ now given. Seek totem omnibus, quad totem singulus. Um, that as he's dividing up the literal bread and passing out pieces of that bread, um, what Aquinas is emphasizing here is that the totem, all of Christ is given in all to omnibus singulis, to all of the people in all of these singular pieces. So that question of breaking the bread, are you breaking up the body of Christ into its individual parts? No, each individual part is the fullness, the totality of Christ. Um, and then we come down to, and we'll notice when um, Quinn does the translation here, he skips a cute few verses. Um, at the end here, um, Panis Angelicus. Panis Angelicus fit Panis hominum, dat Panis Hylicus figuris terminum, o res mirabilis, manducot dominum pauper servis et humilis. Um, the bread that the bread of angels is made bread, the bread of man. So that angelic bread, that which the angels feast on is what humanity has now. 
he gives this heavenly, with this heavenly bread, he gives an end to figures. Um, so where Berengar was talking about how what happens in the Eucharist is that it accepts a figure, that it just becomes a sign of something else. Aquinas is explicitly saying, um, this is the end of figures. There are no more figures here. What we have is reality. Oh, res mirabilis. Res is in this within this world of signs, meaning th signs and things, figure, signum, and res. He's making it as clear as he possibly can that the Eucharist itself is the res. It's not just a figure. This isn't just a symbol of Christ, but Christ is actually in heaven. This is the res mirabilis itself. This is Christ present. Um, and so we end with Mandicat Dominum. So the poor, the slave, and the humble um, are eating the Lord. And then we end, as most hymns do, with um, Trinitarian language. Um, which And this goes back to Ambrose. It's just the way that you write official church hymns. Ambrose, um, back in the fourth century, was confronting the Arian heresy, which said that Christ wasn't fully God. So all of his hymns specifically ended with Trinitarian language, um, because Ambrose knew very well that people would forget his sermons as soon as they got home, but they would be singing his songs all day long. And so as Ambrose was defeating the Arian heresy, he did it through habit, that people would sing their songs. And if they're singing songs about the Trinity, um, that's what they're going to remember. And so that tendency has been taken up throughout all of Catholic hymnody since, and Aquinas um, is no difference here. The Louds hymn that he writes here, Verbum Supernum Prodiens, um, the last two verses of this is Salutaris Hostia. Those those two verses, um, or those two stanzas, end up making the second hymn that's sung at benediction during um, a Eucharistic adoration. So, verbum supernum prodiens. Um, again, what Aquinas is doing is borrowing an intro line, and this is from an ancient hymn. Um, it's Pre-Carolingian, it possibly is Ambrose's. I think they're still deciding about that. Um, the heavenly word proceeding forth in the original one, um, the original hymn is from the Father, um, and it's about the incarnation. What Aquinas is doing is taking that hymn that was originally about the incarnation, um, and he's making it clear that argument that the heretics had against the Eucharist, that if Christ is present here, he's no longer with the Father. Um, again, Aquinas is going to make it as clear as possible. Nec patris liquin dexterum. He is, he's, the heavenly word is coming to us, but he is not leaving the Father. Um, and this goes, this requires that sacramental world view where the divinity is not limited in spatial extension the way that material reality is. What was a material stumbling block for Beringer um, is something that we don't have to worry about. Um, that Christ is with us present and still with the Father and not in a divided sense. Um, And then he's here responding to one of the questions, which is about how what's the proper way of receiving the Eucharist? Um, do you have to receive it under both species? Um, and it's the twelfth, the twelfth century and the thirteenth century is when they they made a shift and stopped. Um, they stopped the normal habit of giving wine to the laity um, for the simple issue of how easy it is to drop a crumb from the house, how much easier is it to drop a single drop of the blood of Christ and the issues involved in that. Um, so, quibus subina specie carnum detit et sanguinum, ut duplici substantiae totum cibad et hominum. He gave himself in either kind, he gave his flesh, he gave his blood, in love's open fullness thus designed to be for humankind the food. Um, 
underneath the two species, he gave blood and flesh. Um, the point being that both species have the totality of Christ, that you don't need to have both to have all of Christ. Having one, having simply one contains all of it. Um, and it actually led to a question about what would the proper moment for elevation be? Does it, can it be after this is my body or do you have to wait until after this is my blood? Um, and it sounds like kind of theological quibbling and much of medieval thought sounds like theological quibbling. Um, but the real question is, if you have to have both species, you can't do the elevation after this is my body because it's not fully Christ without the blood. That was the argument. Um, and of course, the proper solution to that is know that both species have the totality of Christ. The same way that Christ isn't divided physically into the particles of the host, um, Christ isn't divided with just the body over here and just the blood over there. Um, but rather, under both species, he gives blood and flesh. And then O Salutatis Hostium, um, um, the last two verses there are the ones that are familiar because when you go to Eucharist Adoration, that's the second hymn that's sung um, at the end. And then finally, the most of everything that he writes, this is the most remarkable. It's what's called the sequence, Laudacy and Salvatorum. Um, the sequence is something that we just, it was a, Incredibly important in the Middle Ages, it's not today. Um, there's only three feasts that require um, the sequence now, Pentecost, Corpus Christi, and I can't remember the third one off the top of my head. Um, but after the third reading, before the Alleluia, before the Gospel, it, they came up with, um, and this was huge in the 11th and 12th centuries, what was called the sequence, which was a long hymn um, that was not scripturally based, but ref in some way tied to the particular mass. So Laudacy and Salvatorum, and unless I want to turn this into another half an hour, I don't have time to go through all of it here. Um, but you should hear this um, because the sequence is supposed to be part of the Corpus Christi mass. Actually, let me take that back. I'm not positive. If your church doesn't hear it, I don't want you to think that I just said they're doing something wrong. So let me remove that. You might hear this on Sunday. Um, but this is where Aquinas is able to put into poetry what you basically see as the full philosophical exposition that he gives about the real presence in um, his Summa Theologica. And I'll include a link for that as well. Um, if you're interested right now, I can pull that up. Of course, I thought I had this copy, but it never quite works out that way in real time. So whereas the other ones might have been more effective, um, you're imagining Christ with his disciples that he's about to leave. Um, here, you have a beautiful hymn, but a hymn that packs as much doctrine without being overbearing as possible. Um, I mean, it's the supreme doctrinal poem of the Middle Ages. Um, It manages to remain poetry. That is, it's not just philosophy that he's found a, a way of rhyming. He's not just cramming it in there. Um, and he goes through there. He's able to go through the figures of the Old Testament. That is the images out of the Old Testament that bring us to um, understanding what the Eucharist is. Um, particularly here in the end, we have the, the, that figure again, off in figuris presignator, cum Isaac immolator, agne pasque deputator, dator mana patribus. Um, 
those three final figures of the Old Testament, Isaac on the altar, the Paschal feast, the manna sent from heaven, all of these are understood in figural interpretation as having been real events. They're not just symbols. They're not just stories. They actually do happen. But the way that sacramental worldview works, all of history is connected because time is not something that just moves in one direction and is a series of unconnected moments. Time itself is the unfolding of divine providence. And so all moments are connected back to each other. And so here, Isaac on the altar, the Paschal lamb, and the manna that comes down from heaven, they all have significant meanings at the original time, but they all point to this Eucharist itself. Uh, and we'll notice fragmento, fractura, fracto, how often you have versions of that frangere is the Latin word to break something. Um, that question of breaking the Eucharist, but what happens? Um, that it remains the fullness of Christ is something that appears throughout that. Um, and I think I just have to leave end on that note. Um, just the wonder that is this incredible sequence that would really require a solid 15 minutes of exposition to do it justice. Um, I will include links. Um, I borrowed all, I borrowed all of these translations um, from a site that included them with um, explanations. I'll include that in the email with all the other links that I want to send out. Um, so with that, I will say thank you very much for staying with me through all of this. Um, thank you very much for having signed up for this. What I hope is that this has been spiritually meaningful for you. Um, in some way, anyway. Um, and I'll get back to you with the links, the recording itself. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to email me those, um, and I'll try to answer those in something that I send out to the group. Um, again, thank you all very much, and I hope the year of Eucharistic revival is spiritually edifying for all of you. <laughs>